Hello, world. Welcome to another episode of The Deep Dive with Eyal Shai. I'm joined today by Nicholas McKay. Hi, Nicholas. Hello, Eyal. How are you? Um, excellent. Doing fine. And without further ado, what is an idea that has helped you live well? Well, um, if you would have asked me this maybe a year or two ago, it would have definitely been the overview effect, uh, which is kind of the... Um, cognitive shift that uh, astronauts have have uh, reportedly had when they go up into space and see the the earth and I still would maybe put that at you know eighty um, percent but then I think now i 've kind of uh, not fully been brought back down to earth, but uh, I do have a little bit more grounding and so I mean the big idea that I would say is um, is is you know an uh, a curiosity that is grounded. Um, instead of just a limitless curiosity. Uh, one of the things that I was, you know, really interested in, you know, growing up was with, with, with space, you know, and being an astronaut and looking at the cosmos and all that kind of stuff. And, and it still is, you know, I, I, I really, you know, enjoy that kind of stuff. I love geeking out on, you know, all things space. But then now I think that some of that has been like co-opted by, I wouldn't say, you know, nefarious interests, maybe, maybe that's too strong of a word, but special interests of, of sorts. And I think also like sometimes when you look too much at the stars, then you forget that you're on earth, you know, you're, you're literally on a ball, uh, already, you know, you're all on, on soil, you know, on dirt, on continents and, and all this kind of stuff. And, and kind of, uh, ingrained with, with a humanity and a spirit that of course has like eyes for exploration, um, but if we look at the historical record, uh, of, you know, uh, exploration and stuff like that, there, there comes a lot of things with that, a lot of baggage of colonialization of racism of, you know, all kinds of stuff. And so for me, I would say that one thing that's living was helped me live a little bit more, um, I wouldn't say pragmatically, but more realistic to like what my, you know, goals, interests, and desires are, is that, you know, a curiosity that is kind of grounded. So, I mean, when you go up to, into the, say, say you're on the International Space Station or say you're, you know, on the moon and you look at Earth, you know, there's kind of four tenets. And I, I wrote about it in, in an essay, basically uh, the same name, the overview effect. And there's, you know, you see that the Earth is, is like just within a black, you know, canvas, it's just lit up, you know, and there's all these stars and, and stuff around it. So it's just kind of hanging there, like in a void, which is, which is pretty trippy. Um, but then another thing is that you see that the atmosphere is like super thin. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's like, you know, if you imagine the apple, it's the skin, you know, of the apple, it's, it's very, the rind, you know, very, very thin. Um, so then that talks about fragility that talks about, you know, all kinds of stuff like that. Um, and then, uh, another kind of thing is that there isn't any borders, you know, there's, there's geographical boundaries, of course, the sea mountains, uh, you know, the different, like, uh, um, like boundaries of, of say like forest to grassland to, you know, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And, and then also like the fourth thing is again, more of the psychological effect. Um, I watched this movie. It was called first, like on the overview or overview. And uh, it was, you know, on Vimeo a bunch of years ago and then it got turned and there was just basically, I think like a, what was it? What do you call it? Um, like a test shoot, you know, they did a bunch of interviews and then put it out, but then they basically re-edited it and uh, like made it snazzy. And it was called this movie called planetary. And it was really awesome. Mm. And one of the things that they took was, um, you know, astronauts, talking about it, you know, philosophers, academics, you know, all this kind of stuff. And one thing that stuck out to me, um, it kind of really hit home and really got me going on all this stuff is, um, is this philosopher at, said that, um, you know, when, when the Earthrise photo taken on Christmas Eve, like 1969 or whatever it was, Something like that, seventy nine. I can't remember. I it was on time like early seventies, probably. No. Okay, so yeah, so basically, but it was the first time that Earth, you know, was seen in its whole, you know, in its its largest kind of, uh, um, 
in all its glory, if you will. And, right. and it was just kind of mysterious and all this other stuff. But then the philosopher went one more, went more and said, that was the first time that earth saw itself. Mm-hmm. And so that like really, you know, r- really kicked it into gear in that, um, all these astronauts and all these people, uh, and I nicknamed it this thing called a United or a Unified Planetary Protection Society, <laughs> just as like a, a, a little jing, you know, a little uh, moniker. But basically, the entire deal is that like when they go up there, they just, you know, they want to protect Earth. They just want to protect everything. And if you're a Martian or an alien or something looking at Earth, it doesn't matter what comes out of Earth. It could be, you know, man made stuff like rockets, satellites, like you know, in material stuff, or it could be, you know, humans, or it could be monkeys, or it could be, you know, dogs, cats, like whatever. It doesn't, you know, matter at all. Insects, bees that they've, you know, sent up and all of them are earthlings. So Mm -hmm. one of the things that, you know, astronauts feel is that like this big connection. And then, uh, one of this guy, this guy, uh, I can't remember his name, but in, you know, he was one of the first astronauts. He, he basically made this famous, and I'm paraphrasing, but he 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 basically made this famous uh, exclamation of like, you know, we need to take the world leaders up here. And, oh yeah, uh, grab and them by them grab them by the yeah exactly. by the neck and lift them and say, do you see? Yeah, yeah, do you, exactly. Do you understand now? Basically, exactly. And so you know, all of that is kind of like what set me off on this direction of. Um, creating, you know, this kind of, uh, intellectual project, if you will, um, uh, called eclectic spacewalk that I started. Um, and it was, you know, just started off as like a roundup of interesting ideas and podcasts and, you know, all kinds of stuff like that, like that I was just kind of, um, basically just rounding up, you know, and sending to some friends. And then I decided to do it a little bit more seriously and made a sub stack and then, you know, made a podcast and then, uh, started dating, you know, a girl that's a cinematographer, Christine, and who's my girlfriend now. And, and we basically have made, you know, a bunch of short films and we continue to do so. Um, but yeah, it's just been this whole like big, uh, three-year project of just like, you know, taking, taking what, what comes and, and all of that started from just being curious. And then now it's like, I'm trying to refine that a little bit more into. So that was, so that was, as the name suggests, very, very eclectic. Yeah, exactly. Right? That's, that's this that, is what that's you what mean, that do. it's, that it's unbounded and um, yeah. And you were just putting a lot of, uh, a lot of different things in a, in, in a pot. And, yeah, um, I mean, the biggest thing like was diverse, like sourcing, you know, because like I'd, I've had to, uh, so I went to school for broadcast journalism and I was like a TV reporter and then, you know, basically like was uh, trained, you know, in, in school and, and uh, to become basically a reporter and a journalist. And uh, I graduated in the economic downturn of 2009. And basically that changed everything where, you know, you're supposed to be a TV person with a camera guy or a woman and then like uh, an editor. And then that all changed. And it was like, well, you do, you go do all three of those as a one man band and then you get paid, you know, a third of the money, you know, so it was it was just ridiculous. So I got out of that. But then I still had that training and stuff and, and eclectic. Um, you know, I'm looking up the definition right now. So it's like uh, selecting or employing individual elements from a variety of sources, systems or styles uh, made up of or combining elements from a variety of sources. So for me, as like a journalist, that was like kind of an eye opening kind of thing to have that as as my basis is that like you're always worried about sourcing you know where where does this information come from what is kind of the narrative uh being not just spun but like what is the kind of things taken away from that um and then i was just kind of you know intrigued by i i, I love the eclectic you know as a word i mean my favorite word is plethora so like you know a lot of different so like eclectic is maybe my second favorite word you yes. know and so like all these diverse sources and then you know when you take when you go outside the international space station or any you know space vehicle you know say the space shuttle back in the day is that you do a space walk you know and then that's kind of like where where i got it it was like well wait a second like there's kind of a vantage point that you can get to that kind of like kind of no it doesn't nullify or doesn't forget but it nullifies some of the differences of like say you know um different cultures, uh, being at war with each other or, you know, different, um, regimes like fighting with each other, you know, and like different peoples, like hating each other because of past yeah, historical it, 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 acts. It, it makes, it makes everything look peppy, right? I mean, this is like, 
uh, you you feel no uh, nothing when you watch two um, ant colonies kind of fight it out. You say <laughs> this is just ants. You know, you can imagine that for them it's it's life or death. It seems very serious, and you understand that it um, really doesn't doesn't mean much in the in the large scheme of things. Well, I mean, but, but then at the same time, like, I mean, I, but I also went like way down that rabbit hole of like, you know, if you really want to get, if you want to break your brain, like start just, you know, uh, look, you know, simulating what the, you, you know, the, not just earth, but then also like the solar system and the mm-hmm. galaxy. So like, just yep. to give a little timeline, I mean, we're sitting here in 2022, but we know for sure in like a billion years that the sun, our sun is going to become like a red giant, you know, and then it's basically going to, you know, engulf. keep expanding and expanding. And it's going to basically engulf like Mercury first, Venus, and then eventually, I think, get out towards like the size of the orbit of Earth. So it's like we're toast for sure. Any way you get about it. So like there is something to be said about like you know, in a billion years, but then that's a billion years. And then that's another thing is like the, um, the Andromeda galaxy and the Milky way galaxy are on a collision course, you know, to each other. So they're going to hit. And then if you really want to get crazy, then you can go all the way to like the heat death of the universe, you know, and like all this kind of stuff. So like there's, there's, it there seems to be a cap on like humanity, you know, at, at some level, uh, theoretically. Um, but then also, like I was just talking about, like this want and desire to get out into the space. Now that's being co-opted as well as this, like you know, long-termism. You know, Phil Torres, uh, he's an interesting guy that I've been following and he basically studies like existential risk and I'm going to try to get him on the podcast. Um, but he had it like, and, and it's, it's funny because like a lot of this, like, like I'm in the middle of two like contentious ideas, you know what I mean? Cause I can, I'm trying yeah. to see the best out of both of them, but then at some levels they become, uh, you know, not exactly unequal, but, it, uh, it, it depends on how far you take them. You know, there's not this like utopic or dystopic kind of like good versus evil, you know, this versus that, like there's, yeah. there's, 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 it's way too complex for that. So basically like Stuart Brand. So, so I want to, I want to ask you for a minute, Nicholas, mm-hmm. in, uh, the overview effect. Uh, uh, first, let's start with it. If we're, if we're going to do the ping pong between the two uh, vantage points, yeah, which, sure. which is excellent. It's like, what, what did that do to you in terms of, of, your life of being able to um, uh, deal with things? Like, was it just something that you could turn to now that you've encountered certain um, uh, hardships or challenges or something like that? Like, how did you, uh, when did you find yourself um, turning your attention to this vantage point and the, and the benefit it brings in the sense that you can see things clearly and maybe not get too caught up in things mm. that might prove to be small. Mm, I mean, I would say uh, like the first thing that comes to mind would be like uh, shared humanity. That would be the, I guess the easiest way to kind of, kind of throw it is that like, you know, growing up in, in Tennessee and then moving to, uh, you know, Chicago and then Los Angeles living in New York, like it was around a lot of diverse people and a lot of, you know, love, but a lot of hatred as well. And then traveling, you get to see that the, I was in the news business, you know, and you, you, that gets amplified. And then especially with social media, it just like turns it up to 12, you know, uh, on the, on the scale. And so for me, the overview effect really kind of just brought me back down or, you know, it, it had some, it, some things of like ambitiousness and like, this is the forefront of, you know, they always say space is the next frontier. If you want to get, you know, down Star Trek, Trekkie vibes and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, all this kind of stuff. And, and, and it really felt like, oh man, like we're, we're, we're great and we're awesome and, and everything like that. Um, and then that helped in terms of like looking, you know, at like, oh, that those are minor squabbles, you know, bef- between people. Like if you were to say, go back in history or go in the future, then like, are these squabbles real? Are they not? Or, you know, all this stuff. So it's more of a theoretical exercise, but then I guess the more practical thing, like in my day-to-day life was, you know, shared humanity, forgiveness of people. Oh, you're, you know, that person used to be just a little baby, you know, <laughs> like yeah. you, you couldn't do anything, you know? You know, and then like 
learn to tie their shoes and like, you know, scrape their knees and fucking, <laughs> uh, you know, like basically, you know, got turned down, uh, and had relationship issues in high school and like all these, all these things that everyone goes through, you know? And it's like, so for, but my biggest thing was that I was trying to, at least for myself, I mean, I still don't know if I've exactly fi- found it. Uh, but for me, it, it works for at least now is that, you know, to come around some point of like, uh, shared connection, shared humanity, shared, uh, you know, brotherhood, sisterhood, all those kind of things that like, you know, re- religions and the great, you know, kind of things of the past, uh, talk about. And, and I mean, I grew up Southern Baptist, like in the Southern United States and, you know, went through all that kind of stuff and, and I'm not religious anymore. Um, but then at the same time, like I've also taken psychedelic drugs and I'm not going to just sit here and say that there's nothing out there, you know, and be so hubris, yeah. hubristic, you know what I mean? So like, it's just what it is. I don't know. You know, I, and it's not like to be like flaccid or like blase and just say I'm agnostic. It's just like, you know, like I, I have my beliefs and in, in certain things and they work for me, but then the one belief I do have is like, you know, and it may be very humanistic of me and, and, uh, and, you know, maybe puts a hierarchy of, you know, species or animals a little bit, but like, I do believe in, you know, the common person I've seen, you know, in disasters, uh, people helping each other, you know, at a drop of a hat or, or just, uh, you know, regular times in during the day. But then I've also seen, you know, people, uh, uh, taking advantage of people, you know, in disasters and just on the regular day to day. So, but that's what yeah. makes us human. And that's kind of the beauty of things. And so for me, the overview effect kind of just like, takes a lens that is so big that like you kind of miss it, but, but it's not so big as in like the overview effect is like, remember the overview effect is you're looking at earth. You're mm-hmm. not looking out into the stars, like the Hubble space telescope that like right. you're seeing, you know, the, the pillars of creation that are, you know, billions of years old and billions of light years away and blah, 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 blah. You know what I mean? It's like, no, like there is something about that, but then now, I've kind of, and, and now I go to grad school at, at uh, Technical University of München here, here in Munich, Germany. And like, stu- I'm studying a master's program in science, technology, and society. Um, and then, so I'm like really trying to critique, you know, these ideas and, and, and not just science and technology, but then the process of it. And, and, and it's, it, it might be egotistical of me to try to think that, you know, I can do something or all, but then that's kind of the human spirit is that I, I do think I can do something of note and has that came down from, you know, me making, you know, an impact of the world and everything when I was maybe in, in high school or, or just after college or something like that. And, you know, you're in your early twenties and just like, you know, getting after it and doing these things and, and thinking big thoughts and all that stuff. But then now it's like, well, I, I, I want to be more pragmatic about it. And then I want to be more focused and then like yeah, use my so, skill sets. So, you know, so if, if, if we were to uh, kind of explore uh, where, where the overview effects, um, so you were, you were turning to it as you wanted to, um, get, get a sense of, you know, like you say, it's, it's looking back at earth. I, I really like that. You said that it's looking back at earth and not just anywhere, which is to say, mm-hmm. it's, it's not about looking and seeing that everything is meaningless. It is looking about earth and also finding uh, potential and really 100%. seeing things as, as they are. And I'm also often amazed uh, at how you know little time we we spend on really celebrating the the little the small steps forward that humanity is making um, mm-hmm. in culture, whether it's um, gay rights or you know equality, like a growing equality between all sorts of all sorts of humans, right? Um, mm-hmm. We we very rarely kind of celebrate that there there is not a day to celebrate it and we never seem to quite celebrate the fact that yes we have come together and we have raised a voice and we have gained a critical mass and now um a huge number of people that used to be persecuted for something you know it's it's not just the gay community but all sorts of of differences that were just not accepted only only centuries back right their species exist for 200,000 years and just centuries ago, these people were persecuted, witches, right? I'm, I'm happy that there is no, no such notion of, of a witch anymore. 
or anything like that. So I wanted to really um, strengthen this point of yours, which I which I really like. And I also wanted to um, kind of riff on the on the going going back out to see back inside. And I might have discussed it on the podcast before, but my favorite author, Kurt Vonnegut, um, mm-hmm. not only Great uses author. in his sci-fi uh, different planets from which you could look back at Earth and time travel mm-hmm. and uses all that and all of the mechanisms that he, the literary uh, devices that he uses are aimed at um, estranging yourself from from your regular vantage point so you can see things uh, for what they are and that you could see that uh, wars are horrible because he experienced it uh, firsthand, but also that, you know, as as hurt as you might be from suffering all these um, cruelties sometimes, the only, it's almost um, absurd the, the way we, we pick our emotions and attitude. And if it's all absurd, then there's no reason why we shouldn't be optimistic and loving towards um, other human beings. So those are just a, a couple of things that uh, came to my mind. And I'd like to really see, um, really kind of understand um, where the overview effect stops being that. Yeah, yeah. That um, you. Well, I mean, I can push up. So, yeah, some of that. Like, I mean, so for instance, like a couple of things, I think that, that when it stops becoming useful is like, I guess you could say, either blind naivety or willful ignorance, you know, those, mm. those kind of things, because it is so great. So for instance, like you used a, a good example of like, you know, uh, you, you know, gay trans bot, you know, all that kind of stuff. Like that was once, you know, persecuted you know, long ago, uh, even up until, you know, the, uh, even recently, but then here, say for instance, the United States where I, where I come from, well, now there's a concerted effort in the news, you know, to like push back against the winds of, you know, legalized gay marriage that was within 10 years ago because there's now like this entire like hysteria behind you know teaching children basically in schools a la crt which is critical race theory which is just you know not so nuts as saying that like we shouldn't uh you know be um proud of our history and proud of our you know other things that we've accomplished but then to be realistic about like well, what, what does, what did that mean? So in, in, the easiest way you can say it is like, you know, for instance, like say black um, people who basically uh, fought in Vietnam, right? So like, oh man, that's great that we were allowing black people to like fight in our wars and blah, 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 like for, for generations. But then like what happened when they got home? Well, they saw, you know, basically uh, home prices like either skyrocketed or not even eligible to get mortgages. Those are both real things, you know what I mean? So like, just like now there's also this panic behind like Disney and like grooming kids like for pedophilia and like whatever, just because, you know, teachers are now being inclusive in classrooms for children to like basically be more emotional and be more into their thoughts of sexuality, of inclusiveness and all this kind of stuff. So there's a real like moral panic that is now a pushback. But then going back to your original thing is that like, well, that's always going to happen. You know, you make, you make certain, you know, uh, achievements and then there's going to be kind of a blowback or a ratchet effect and stuff like that. But then, like you said, is like, there's no reason to be pessimistic because that's not going to get you anywhere. You have to be optimistic and, and things like that. Um, and so like, I guess for me is that you lose, like one of the things that I have issues with is like, people have taken this idea of like the overview effect or other things. And it's like, we're going to go build, you know, new fucking societies on Mars. And it's like, what? Like you, we're all humans though. You know what I mean? Like you just are going to erase like history. Like how, how's that going to work? Like, have you read sci-fi like Ken Stanley Robinson, you know, about the, you know, the, the Mars series, um, you know, within the first 20 pages, like politics comes up, you know what I mean? Of like, how do you organize a society? How does punishment happen? How does justice, like all this kind of stuff. And so what I have is that like, people use it as a crutch and like, okay, well, we're going to create something new. And it's like, that's easy to say. That's easy. That's naivety. It's like, no, the hard thing is to deal with all the problems we have here. Mm. And then like, 
you know, make it better there, you know, and, and, and stuff like that. And it's like, it's almost like psychotic thinking that like, we're going to go to Mars or the moon or the, throughout the cosmos and stuff like that and not bring our own problems, you know what I mean? And not bring the institutionalization of certain things and, and not just with race or, or gender, but class power, um, you know, like all that kind of stuff. And so for me, the biggest thing I would say, like the, the biggest the thing is to push back against like the um, amazingness of humanity, because then you, all you got to do is open a history book and then look at all the atrocities that, you know, people have committed like throughout the ages. Yeah. And so like, that's kind of what, but I don't, I also don't want to say that I see I'm like 50, 50. When I started this, I said like 80, 20, you know, kind of deal. Cause <laughs> it is like, I do think that there has to be almost like a lion's share of like ambition and like, you know, cause like there's nothing, you know, that sells and that markets and that like gets investment and new people and new industries and, and that kind of stuff. But then at the same time, I think if you went all the way, you know, with that, it is blind na naivete, you know, and then like willful ignorance of like our past and, and what we, you know, should. And, and again, some of this stuff is very normative thinking, you know what I mean? Like, again, I'm not saying that I have the answers, but I can tell you that like, you can find a lot of the answers and it's not like this is like some, um, uh, epistemological, um, nihilism. You know what I mean? Like we, we, we're not starting from scratch every time. Like we have, you no, know, scholarship. I, think, I, and think, you know? I think we, we, we don't have to go to Mars to realize that, you know, every revolution in the past was, um, was made possible because uh, masses of people had a belief that they can bring about something better without mm -hmm. without a plan in place. And then what uh, what turns out to be the case once there's no plan that some uh, nefarious power seeking uh, uh, junta or you know yep. a, a ruler is going to rise to the top because they're unscrupulous and now there's this exactly the kind of um, breathing grounds for ideologies that uh, there's a vacuum, yeah. there's a vacuum basically. So it's very, uh, very easy to rise to the top now because you're not, um, you've, you've had all this, uh, the masses of people topple down a, a central government, which only masses mm -hmm. of people can do because mm -hmm. the centralized government are very good at killing off like individuals who are going to prove to be in opposition. Right? They, they can, yeah, of course yeah, they can pick those off. It's only a massive uprising that they can topple a dictator, let's say. But once they do the people, uh, I think it, um, the, the way they got this uh, consensus is play in place to do that is because the ideas were very vague. And if the ideas were very vague, um, then they're very vulnerable to be exploited by some new unscrupulous a uh, potential dictator who has ideas that are not vague at all. No, they're going. To yeah, right. <laughs> they're very so, specific. <laughs> so, you know, this is this is what um, happens uh, time and time again. You know, we see it with the revolution in, in Iran, which uh, the people of Iran did not bring about an Islamic revolution. You know, they just wanted to do away with the Shah, which was a, a U.S. construct. And you can kind of sure. see the sense in that. And of course, then you have the extremists. Um, taking over. You can see this in, in Egypt in 2012. Um, you can see this happening over and over again, right? Um, so I, I really like I really like the thinking and, and how you put it now that we need to own uh, the past and really think about how we're going to do things. And uh, this is a, a big question. This is a big 100%. question. Because if you have a, a a power that's that's sitting there and it, and it's been in power for a while it kind of ossifies right like almost by definition it just stays the way it is and is not uh, innovative about what it's going to do and this is lacking and things just go downhill from there in for society yeah. I mean, we um, have one example right now, the UN, you know, like look at the Security Council, people that can like Russia, right. United States, like, you know, yeah, uh, China, we can China, we cannot. They And that was just, oh, well, let's let's go back in history. Why did the UN start happening? Oh, it was like the, the powers that won World War Two. Fantastic. That was in 1940, you know, five, six, yeah. you know, whatever. And then like we still are dealing with that. And then like even my own country, the United States, like 
I mean, we're the only country that, you know, basically doesn't have like full, or, or I mean, one of the uh, things that like doesn't recognize, you know, child, uh, you know, feeding every child, like to, to food is a right for children. Like what? Like, what do you mean? Like we're the only country. And when you see graphs of like the world or the, like maps of the world, and then it's like the U S is lit up and the entire world yeah. <laughs> it's like, is another country or another color. You're like, what's going on here? You know? And it's like, it's all about power and, and ridiculousness. So like, if you want to take the, the grandiose and the amazingness, like humans are awesome, you know, fucking they're amazing, you know, from all the stuff we can do and build and, and motions and everything. But then the other thing is like, you know, on, on a more realistic and, and again, not to get too dystopic, but just like reality is that humans are messy. You know what I mean? Like this is like humanity is messy, you know, and it's not easy. It's not like self, uh, 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 self-referential. It's not like, and now like that's where the overview effects kind of comes in. And, and again, like this is, this is n- not it, like, I'm not sitting here saying that like, this is like a full out fleshed out theory, but I'm, I'm, it's more pointing towards like basically, um, you know, more of a the theological kind of dimension, you know what I mean? Of like, well, the only really way to get that many people to like figure out, you know, idea, an idea that is like so complex, but so simple is to like make, I don't want to say a religion because that has like negative connotations, but a belief system, you know, it's like, but if, if we, if, if each individual person had a belief system that like you really, you know, did have human rights, like real human rights, you know, you, you would always have food in your belly, always have water, you know, to, to drink and a food over your head, or I mean, a, a house over your head and clothes on your back. And then a way to like, you know, be happy, you know, the, all the things that people have proclaimed, I mean, fuck like Thomas Jefferson, you know, the pursuit of happiness and all that stuff. But then at the same time, he was a slaveholder, you know what I mean? And then right. had like, so, you know, like father children with, with a fucking slave, you know what I mean? It's like, so there there's again, humans are messy. So like there can be great ideas, but then also there's these re- re- reality checks that we have to be honest about. And so one of the things in STS that I'm studying is like, or uh, one of the um, central tenets is reflexivity. The idea of reflexivity is that any type of like models, any type of like research, any type of scholarship, you have to basically reflect on and be reflexive about your own biases, but not your own, but like institutions, your school, you know what I mean? Like your processes, the methods themselves, because at least, and again, this is where it gets kind of interesting. And like you were talking about before, it's like, we're on this kind of like trajectory. That's definitely not linear by any means, but it is a trajectory of sorts is that we're getting towards some type of knowledge and understanding is that at least for me, I would much rather have information that is, that has been through the reflex ringer, you know what I mean? Then not because like me as a journalist and sourcing and all this kind of stuff. Now, whether or not you want to believe the reflexivity, well, then that's up to like prove it, showing your work. And then the, the scientific method comes in of like, well, in any method is only as good as the its last iteration, you know what I mean? And like, if it's only, if it's always like, that's why the scientific method in its, in its uh, process, not as its scientism in its right. ideology, right. it's like, well, no, there's a central tenet is that, well, the, you know, your results are only as good as your last experiment because you can have some dude or some girl or some thing or some whatever come out and then just take your idea and shove it down the toilet because it's got better results. You know what I mean? Or more specific results within sh- uh, smaller error bars, yeah. et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And well, so it's D- like, David, okay. Do- David Deutsch would say uh, a better explanation. You can come up with a better explanation now. Perfect. And once you yeah. have a, a better explanation, that is, um, that is almost a uh, negative space. I was just mm-hmm. talking a lot about it with other people recently, but uh, the idea of negative space is that you don't set out to draw the the shape that you want to see. Instead, mm-hmm. you uh, painstakingly kind of paint everything around it and explore the shape as it is, and you paint anything outside of it. And then oh, uh, it okay. turns out that that you don't you don't actually draw the shape and try to get it right and hope that you get it right. You just see things as they are. And in the end, what you're left with is a shape that you can't unsee and that you've checked 
um, mm. quite diligently to see that this is reality. And this is, mm-hmm. uh, this is, I think, an explanation as opposed to, uh, as opposed to uh, a result or a dogma, as opposed to justified true belief, which is uh, what people, uh, a lot of people mistakenly think science is about, that you have a, a belief that now is justified and, and true through experimentation. No, what you what you should look out for are explanations because they are um, they are the dark matter. They are the, yeah, they, yeah, they, yeah. they are the invisible filaments that hold um, di- uh, disparate things together, and you don't see them. They're like negative space, but you also can't unsee them. They must be there because these things are now configured in this particular way. And there must be something holding them. Uh, that's that's the way I, how I see um, explanation and knowledge. And if anybody's coming up with better experiments and better theories, well, not even experiments, theories first, better mm-hmm. explanations, because a, a good explanation can can hit home exactly. You might not even need an, an experiment is desirable if possible, but even if not, if you get a good explanation, it can make uh, the former explanations. Uh, look terrible uh, just a hundred percent and it's it's funny you mentioned that because like that's that's interesting like negative spaces and and like so one thing i talked to 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 nico about and and definitely listened to uh the deep dive with 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 nicholas uh the other nicholas if you will (laughs) uh from from munich um the coach and and stuff is that uh i i introduced him in this and maybe this is the first time you've heard about but are you familiar with nora bateson um, who's like complexity researcher. His her dad was like uh, uh, Gregory Bateson, the famous kind of systems thinker. Okay, so um, his name I'm definitely familiar with, and her I'm not so sure. So she came up with this kind of very interesting thing that kind of comes along with like negative space and liminality and stuff is uh, warm data. So like data, like cold data is your you know your facts, your figures, your you know your data, you know, all the kind of numbers that whatever. And then warm data is I'm looking at our website now is, is that other kind of information, the emulsifier at the unspoken levels of why anyone does what they do. So like in complexity, um, warm data is information that is alive. Warm data itches when it is confined. So warm data is why setting up multiple committees to solve the world's problems of ecological and economic disaster will never work. The issues can never be separated, you know, because basically you're trying to, you're always like, you know, it's whack-a-mole, you know, that like game, you know, Mm -hmm. there's always going to be something that comes up. And so, um, the biggest thing is, is to, is to like lean into that though. It's not to like shy away, you know, and, and, and it's, it's something to like look at of, of the, the, again, the, the vastness, the complexity, the, everything that the world we live in today. I mean, we, this, again, some of the things it's like, it's 2022, it's not 1922. Like as, as much as there might've been complex worlds and complex ways of thinking and feeling, I'm not saying that there wasn't a hundred years ago. I'm just saying that now is in a different time. And yes, like we are, you know, better for worse, like whatever. It, it doesn't matter. Like that kind of doesn't matter. It's, it's what you can kind of either, and I don't want to say prove, but make yourself believe in, you know, and that's kind of like more the currency uh, of things that, that, that is around. And so I'm really interested in kind of those things, uh, more so than say like, you know, quant- like quantitative data, for, for instance, like this is, here's, here's a, here's a, you know, case study or re- thing two days ago, the IPCC, you know, the international panel of climate change came out with this like 3000, you know, page report, like, fucking huge like jesus christ like but then you have people that like go who are like really into that and nerding out about it who then read the whole thing you know what i mean and like go through it and then i think the policy recommendations were like 134 pages like just policy recommendations yeah you know and it's like so a lot of this stuff like and so one of the things that comes in it's like okay now the prescription like to what to do about things that's where i think we get kind of too um for sure in ourselves. Now, some Mm. of the things like the scientific process, like for instance, we're taking core samples. Like we've taken core samples in Antarctica, in the Arctic, in Greenland, in all these different places where literal air molecules have been trapped since 
10,000 years ago. And from the time that we can go back, this is the warmest it's ever been. And there's like, there's no like if, ands or buts. Now, is there something that could come along? Yes. Like that's, that's what it is. But the, but the air bars getting to like a hundred percent are, are, are slowly going down. Now that's when I think these, you know, like the, the hierarchies of sort of knowledge, you know, come in the, uh, the sh- uh, snake oil salesman, uh, the, the junta, you know, all that kind of stuff. It's like, they come in and then try to prescribe what is best. And it's like, now then we're, get, then we're now we're really talking because it's, 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 instead of saying that something is something um, it's, it's better to say this through this process is what we're getting from this. The results are through this process. And then I think before in, you know, previous times, like, you know, let's just not think, think back to too long ago. I mean, religion had a stranglehold on all this, you know what I mean? And then you could even say institutions, you know, for a long time. And then now with the advent of freaking Twitter and like, you know, insane feedback loops of, of information and stuff for good or for bad, it's, we're, we're progressing in a lot of different ways and figuring out some of this stuff. Now, one of the things that I now I bring up the IPC C report is to not talk about the data. I just gave you all that kind of groundwork and, and kind of background to like kind of set a, a foundation to what we can kind of build on. But it's like, I'm way more interested in like how it's being perceived how it's being filtered through the news. How are people like taking that information as a random person in Iowa or random person in Austria or some, you know, person that's like really getting hit hard by climate change in Bangladesh or in the island nations of Kiribati, you know, who like who they all have the lowest freaking, you know, carbon emissions and yet they're going being hit the hardest by the climate change. And so it's right. like, that's the stuff that I'm more interested in. And like, I'm not a scientist, so I don't even fucking uh, like, I'm taking all this for granted, you know, at, at face value and stuff. But for me and my skill sets in my kind of ways to like, you know, make an impact, if you will, quote unquote, uh, not to get too again, like egotistical is to like, you know, try to, to, to do something. And like, my biggest thing is that, you know, when I was growing up, um, there was always an adage that I do really like from religion is, is, is like uh, in some, in some cases, not all, but it's like you, you know, leave it better than you found it kind of deal. Mm-hmm. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, I, I think that is like a t- powerful idea idea f- because like right now you can have the kind of dystopic thing of like, well, I'm not going to have kids and I'm, you know, th- the climate is going to, screw up the world and all this other stuff. And then you can go the other side of then you just become nihilistic and not give a fuck. You know, I don't give a shit. I'm going to have 18 kids and drive pickup trucks and da, 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 da. It's like, there's, there's obviously a balance, but it's up to your predisposition of a person. But then how do you get a person to even know what is real? And then not just what is real, but then also to do something about it that then make it, you know, different. And that is like, to me, yeah. freaking fascinating. So, you know so, what I mean? Like, so yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, I, I, I think, I think, you know what, and it, it's kind of connecting nodes in my, in my uh, head that maybe we're not connected before, but really, um, uh, well-being, you know, which is the theme of this, of this podcast. Uh, what does it mean mm-hmm. to, to live well, to enjoy well-being, I think that um, basically you said uh, whack-a-mole and I, and I think it's right. And it's very interesting because on a personal level, your life immediately gets better. At least you're given the chance to live a good life when you're not hungry, when you're not starving, you know, when you're not in the island nation that, uh, that gets hit the, the worst. And we in the West are able to, to think about these bigger things and, and think forward and see uh, farther than, you know, further than the next day and what I'm going to eat and all that. And that's great. Um, and there's also, uh, and this, and this was shown in American politics, you know, I think with the rise of Trump too, that some uh, processes are, are accelerating in, in, in a population in an elite that mm-hmm. can afford, mm-hmm. that can afford to think about things that for uh, the majority of people that are not in this position of privilege seems uh, frivolous to to deal mm-hmm. with. Okay, mm-hmm. so for a lot of people, 
for a lot of people, um, the whole talk about trans rights and 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 the trans community, what to do with it, what to do with it, for a lot of people around the world, it seems insane to, to that some people deal with that thing, uh, mm-hmm. which for them makes sense. But over here are populations that are starving, that are losing their children to uh, methamphetamines, um, mm-hmm. that are decimated by other um, uh, drugs and so on. And it's it's very interesting because now you have uh, a, a bubble kind of people who aspire to do these great big things and uh, keep progressing in an exponential way. You know, once we got the rights um, for for this group of people, now we're going to get it to every group of people. Um, but it gets almost to this um, ridiculous place where you are starting to worry about uh, the rights of. Uh, the the kind of the rights of of people from a population that's not even ready for that, where you haven't taken care of the rights to have food, right? Yeah, and that that creates an understandable um, uproar in that community and the feeling of of um, maybe being left left out or or left well, behind. And uh, I'm just trying to tie it back to well being. The reason I'm saying all this is because. I think the whole 3,000 page document, like you say, it's going to treat these very problems, but even the the group of people who can afford to even allocate any sort of mind power to global warming is actually very small. And so Mm -hmm. now I'm seeing this, um, I'm having this epiphany that, Yes, it's good to think about these things, but not if you're not going at the same time, literally put just as many resources, both in terms of of, of thinking and uh, physical material resources into simply getting people fit, into simply getting people educated. So the, the, the attempt to run away from the peloton and start, start, your, uh, start your burst forward as a society because you're in the higher echelons of society, that's going to turn a lot of people against you. And you're mm-hmm. also not going to get your way. You're, you're not going to fix the earth if, if a lot of populations stay um, hungry around the world, if there's not enough uh, well-being. Because um, the problem is that we live a very materially rich life and we surround ourselves with people who are materially rich, then uh, we mistake it. We think that's the whole world, you know, Uh, but our community is still acting very capitalistic and uh, very much in competition with other communities now and maybe on the level of nations. Uh, this is basically the, the, the Scandinavian model of nations, right? Among themselves, mm-hmm. they're, they're very socialist. They give everything that. But I mean, when you get to the level of nations, they're, they're super capitalist. They are competing with other oh, nations yeah. and they are playing dirty tricks. OK, they're not they're not so, that kind on, a, on, a, on the global stage. So I'm saying. No, I'm- yeah, just lift the, the boats of the people who are down right now. This is what is going to uh, actually make it even remotely possible that we fix these um, high problems of, of world hunger, of, of um, global warming, of human rights, and so on. Yeah, no, I mean, I saw a couple of things. I mean, what, what you bring up is 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 interesting because like, Anything that we do right now, right now is under the, an economic capitalist, you know, paradigm period, end of story. You know, that's, that's what it is right now. We can think about X, Y, and Z, but like, that's what it is right now. But then we can critique that. We can be reflexive about that and then say, say like, well, how, what, what is happening? Like, so you were just talking about, you know, a, a, a rising tide. Well, wouldn't it be better that like, and again, this is normative. This is us thinking, you know, theological, but wouldn't it be better if a rising tide did lift all the ships 
You know what I mean? Like, and everyone had a ship that they were on, but that's not what's happening. Everyone is now having to sell their own ship so that one or two or five people can have ships that are the size of tankers, you know, and yachts, the size of like cities on there. And then they don't even get, not just a boat. They don't even have life jackets you know what yeah. I mean? because like um, they're, they're literally drowning. And so that's kind of the thing of like, I wrote about this in like terrestrial politics, like Bruno Latour, uh, the philosopher had a book kind of out of this world is that like, there's like this out of this world of political kind of th- or political economy and philosophy is that is, is, and he turned them like obstructionist elites. Like Elon Musk is a perfect example. Oh, we're going to go to Mars and get out away from all this like crap. You know what I mean? It's like, well, you, you're just like fleeing from the problem. Like, you know, my guy, yeah. like it, it's like, so, but then another thing, that you brought up that I, that I really like, um, is, is like the privilege thing. It's like, that's, uh, and we can tie this into the overview effect is that like, I, I see myself as a bastion of privilege because like, I still like am grounded in where I'm from. So like I grew up in Chattanooga, Tennessee, you know, to, to, to the typical, you know, uh, typical family, you know, mom, dad, like eventually they got divorced, but like, you know, my dad basically did the American dream. You know, he's from Washington, DC, you know, uh, my, my grandfather worked at the state department. And then my mom though, she comes from the Hills of Tennessee. Like she didn't have running water till she was 16 years old. So 1976 in America, in the South, she doesn't have running water. She'll still, she's still using well water, you know, uh, like shooting squirrels and rabbits with BB guns to like have stew, you know what I mean? And, and and stuff like that. So she was the first person to go to college. And then like my family is still there. You know what I mean? Like they live in like a city, you know, all this stuff. But then my other side of my family, they're in the stick still. Like two of my cousins passed away. One, like he was, you know, basically had substance abuse problems in and out of jail, you know, all this stuff. Like you can talk about the opioid epidemic, you know, and, and, and what Appalachia is with that, um, you know, non-education, basically non, you know, good jobs and stuff. Like, you know, my cousin works at, at like literally at a stone quarry breaking up rocks, you know what I mean? It's like, so I, I think about him, you know, all the time. Like what, well, what if I was, you know, born to my aunt instead of my mom, you know what I mean? And, and whatever, mm-hmm. and all this kind of stuff. And so like, I've been trying to use my privilege to always think about, well, how can I help those people? And it's not just like, Hey, solve world hunger. It's like, no, how can you get up to a certain type of knowledge or a certain type of impact to then give back to like where you came from and be grounded in that kind of stuff? And it's not to toot my own horn. It's literally just like, this is my mission, or at least, at least for me, is that I'm trying to figure those things out. And then another thing that you brought up is like, okay, well, how can, how can, you know, there's so many different like, uh, from, you know, people's thinking to what they can do in their lives to like what, you know, uh, communities can do to what governments can do to then what the world can do. Right. So there's many different levels. Well, first and foremost, like, I mean, and, and this is not to say that Aristotelian philosophy is the best, but like, I think one of the tenets that I started on my journey that really like grounded me as well is his, his adage of the only thing I know is I know nothing period. End of story. Like it, 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 it doesn't, it's like, yes, you will know things. It's not to say you're epistem, epistemologically nihil, nihilistic. Right. It's saying that you will never know all of it. Right. That's, that's the, that's the message. You know what I mean? Like you can know as much as you want about any topic, but guess what? You're never going to know it all. So you might as well just fuck, you know, get to the fact that you, you know, the only thing you know is I know nothing. Well, that's step one. You know what I mean? Like, that's that's step one, and then there's many other steps of like, okay, well, how do you want to, you know, uh, impact? Like, uh, you know, what what is it? And it's not to get on these pet causes because one of the things that I'm trying to do is like connect some of these pet causes to then, uh, kind of, you know, make real impact. Um, and then, so you also brought up like, you know, expertise, like, and, and telling people what to like the Western nations and, and especially the Nordic countries, Hey, we're doing it this way. You should do that. Well, another thing from STS that, uh, that is a big tenant, not just reflexivity is, uh, like basically models of science communication. So first and foremost, that are, are not first and foremost, historically, the, 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 the paradigm was the deficit model. Basically experts tell people what's up. 
We, we are, we know what's up. You don't. And then all of a sudden in the eighties and the nineties with like things like HIV and, and like people with AIDS, like telling scientists, you don't know what you're talking about. Like we have the disease and you're telling me this is what's up. And then we're telling you that's not right. So then there basically became like this boundary that didn't exist anymore between expertise and then lay people. And then now we're kind of in this, what, mm -hmm. what uh, STS scholars call the co-productionist uh, model is that, you know, you basically go to where, you know, skin in the game, basically you go where the, the, uh, the rubber meets the road, if you will. And then you, you know, you, the ethnography and like the research and all that stuff is to go where the action is and then learn as much as you can about that, particular kind of like fork in the road or that uh, intersection is a better kind of way to put it. And then learn as much as you can about that, because then that will bear the most fruits uh, from that. And then, so one of the things that's come out of that is, and, uh, and a resurgence that I love is like indigenous knowledge, because like, for instance, the West and like, you know, modernity think we got it all figured out. And yet there were so many other things that like indigenous cultures had it figured out and then have still had it figured out. And we're the ones that are kept playing catch up. You know what I mean? How yeah. to deal with, with certain things. And so all these kind of things are kind of in the way of, I guess you could say intellectualism and, or, I mean, intellectual um, pursuit and, and knowledge pursuit and all this kind of stuff. But then one thing that I'm trying to do, and, and we've talked about this, I think offline, or maybe I, I'm confusing it with Nico, is that one of the things that I'm trying to do in, in my kind of research and in the future is that I want to like Buck, Buckminster Fuller. He, 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 you know, invented the geodesic dome and had a bunch of other like things. Um, he, he had this thing called uh, a, a, an idea called a trim tab. So a trim tab is basically, uh, so you have a rudder on a ship, right? You do, mm -hmm. you go to the, you want to go to the left, then you do the rudder and then it basically pushes the water, you know, to, to that side. And then it's easier for you to skim through the water to then go that way. Well, guess what's in on a rudder is there's a little perpendicular thing called a trim tab. And so the trim tab, as soon as you move, you know, your wheel one way or the other, there is a down pressure that is created on the trim tab that makes it easier for the rudder to then move in whatever direction you want. So right. that's, that, that's kind of the, 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 the specificness of it. And then another idea that comes with that. So trim tab is one, but then key logs. So back in the olden days and like the 1800s, when the, the, a lot of like forestry and like, um, you know, cutting down the forest and stuff what happened almost all the time next to a river because why well they didn't yeah, have like a yeah. hundred percent you didn't have long road truckers you had mules and that's about it you know what i mean and like train or uh, teams of horses and da, 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 right until mechanical stuff and then you they had all that so you had to have it on a river well sometimes because the nature of complexity and chaos and what did we say? Humanity is fucking, you know, that messy. So the same kind of thing is if you send enough logs down a river, just the fluid dynamics, like the, the, the bends in the river meanderings, you know, whatever, sometimes those logs get into a log jam and basically mm -hmm. make an artificial dam. Well, there were these specialists that would come out and they were called key loggers. And so what their job was to do is literally go and find the one, two, three, five. It doesn't matter. The small subset of logs that if you take those logs out, then it will basically just work itself out and the log mm -hmm. jam will artificially basically, uh, you know, become flowing. So that's my thing is like, I don't know if I'm going to make like a consultancy company called trim tabs and key logs or, <laughs> you know what I mean? Or like, I don't, I don't, I don't know. You know, I don't know what my future is, I don't, but, but you know, you heard it here first, you know, but that's, that's kind of the, the kind of ideas that I'm trying to do. And, and I don't want to sit here and say that like, I've got all the answers. No, but what I do have is a drive and ambition to then connect the people that do have the answers in okay. some certain ways. So you 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 just said it. I think I think connect the people says it all. I think the fact right, that you right. say you're still grounded, you're still grounded in that um, Appalachian community that that suffers from um, from uh, neglect, basically neglect yeah, from the rest of the country. When you have um, when you see the division, you know, it's so easy. Like I am among probably, you know, I don't live in the States, but if I were to live in the States, 
Uh, I would be politically uh, left leaning. And, you know, I saw the um, this phenomenon of Trump uh, getting getting in power and was amazed and shocked and all that. But it, it took me some time. And, and the covid uh, pandemic really helped me kind of cement this view that uh, human connection should be emphasized over uh, running towards higher and higher truths. So that's a good point. That's a good. Th- th- this is for me, and I'm I'm not. I will not anymore get into an argument or a fight over facts, over these uh, justified true beliefs with people that science holds. I will not fight them because that's not the point. You know, and a lot of the people that today are called Mm anti-science are simply mad about the dogmatic nature that science uh, that science seems to have today and about the neglect. And when they cry out for help, you know, don't move on. They're telling a lot of us um, in in the elites, the the highly educated, um, the people with the with higher income, they're basically don't you dare go on to solve uh, climate change. Don't you dare go on to solve every um, very specific human right issue mm-hmm. before you make sure that we get food, that we have uh, shelter, that we have these things. You know, this is what they're saying. Is the is the manner in which they do it perfect? Uh, no, because it creates it's 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 divisive and and we don't get it. Maybe it's not the best sort of communication. But have have we been better about communicating? Absolutely not. Uh, a lot of people, a lot of people uh, from the left just double down and uh, on going for these for these higher truths, for these uh, more um, niche and esoteric uh, human right issues. And it's not that they're not important. It is. But you said it, human connection. And now if we're going Mm -hmm. to connect it to the overview effect, we could send each and everyone individually to see for themselves that this is just one planet, that boundaries are not real, et cetera. But borders are relations between Mm -hmm. political entities. And one thing you don't see when you get the overview effect. One thing you don't see is any relationships between real people on the ground. And uh, large swaths of society, or not large, but large enough swaths of society have amassed the wealth that allows them to kind of live in an echo chamber and and run away with the with the ideas that they fancy about these really, really highbrow stuff. But this is not what you do. You work on that with a certain intensity. Yes. Turn your attention to these uh, problems. Turn your attention to the future of the planet. But you have to give just as much attention to the present Mm -hmm. of of the relationships and to the present of the people who are suffering. And these two things are going to these two things are going to resonate together and make both problems go away much easier. And when you said that you're still grounded in the community um, that that you grew up in or grew up near, you know, that really uh, put it in place for me. Because now I understand that this is about human connection. Because the the connection we have with abstract ideas is great. But you're going to need all the people to solve it. Just yeah, I mean, thinking about it is not going to make it go away. But but then that's why also like and and something so like to kind of put it again more into context is like and give you some examples and and this isn't to like again like this this it's just these are the, the the examples I'm familiar with because I was interested in kind of space and whatever is that I uh, went on this um, two week long thing uh, by the Mars Society it was called a Mars Analog Simulation Mission. So I was the crew journalist. And so for two weeks, I lived inside of a habitat in Southern Utah with seven other people from around the world. So a French person or two French people, an Italian girl, two other Americans, one black, one white. And then, uh, also, um, uh, 
yeah, who else? And then, so, and then, oh, oh, and then Anushri, she was Indian. And so like all of them had different, you know, skill sets, different kind of things. And so we lived in a habitat basically mimicking what it's like to live on Mars. Not real, but, you know, like, I mean, we kind of went through the whole thing of like, getting data because, or, you know, a little amounts of data because of the, the, the transmission of light it takes eight minutes to get from, you know, mm-hmm. Mars to earth. Um, we had to like not use, you know, so much or, uh, water in terms of, uh, cause you know, you can only take as so much water like with you, you know? And so like you just recycled water for, you know, using, we didn't have to do that, but it was like on a, on a, uh, on a threshold, you know? And then like, um, we had to depressurize when we went out in like little, these little spacesuits, you know, and, and all this kind of stuff. And it was an immense like learning journey for that because it, I went on this little thing, but then the next level of that is like these other analog missions that are, you know, in Hawaii or another, uh, thing that's not exactly an analog, but then uh, is, um, kind of the crown jewel of this, like working of different, you know, people in the science community is the Antarctic, uh, you know, uh, bases, I mean, you have Russians, you have, you know, people from all over the world and all of them are committed to like science. And like you said, somewhat of a hard truth and stuff like that. But here's another thing that would be the, the, the cold data, right? It's, it's cold. It makes sense. Like blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But then the warm data is all the relationships that these people made while yeah. down there that they continue to have to this day. So I interviewed this, uh, this lady, uh, Dr. Christine Corbett Moran. She, she you know, basically in Los Angeles, she was one of the NASA 50 finalists, you know, a couple years ago. And she was, you know, in charge of like the South pole telescope, you know what I mean? And like, but then one of the, and and obviously we talked about her science and everything, but then she also talked about how crazy it was to like be in this harsh environment. Like you're in Antarctica, you know what I mean? (laughs) Like you go outside and it's like whiteouts and you know, everything else. And then you're in these like, you know, uh, these cramped quarters. And then like, you know, you're having to do all this stuff in all the name of the pursuit of these harsh truths, if you will, or these hard truths. Um, but then the bigger thing that kind of came from that was not just this, uh, cold data and the figures and the doing the science and whatever, but it was the human connection of meeting so many people from across the world that then became maybe not like lifelong, but at least a connection that you could have for your life. So again, Mm -hmm. you're, I, you know, maybe not a lifelong friend that you can just say, Hey, you do ask them whatever, but at any time, you know, you could reach out to them and then like have a connection for life. So that, I think that was an interesting, and then, uh, and I, the, the forefront of this is obviously the international space station, you know, and that maybe it's not right now in terms of like the people on it, you know, cause there's really only say like, you know, a guy from Germany and representing the e- European space agency. There's some Americans representing NASA, Russia, Russo cosmos, and then uh, a J- Japanese for JAXA. So like th- we're still in this kind of elitism hierarchies, you know, whatever, but it is the forefront. So like there has to be something, but then now, you know, what's crazy is that now there's been this giant opening up of the idea of like disabled people going into space because of the harshness of space on the regular human body. So like human bodies, like, you know, your cornea, like, it, 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 you know, like, well, it, it, it like deteriorates. Like basically they've done these twin studies, like for Mar- astronaut Mark Kelly, he went up into space for a year. Like he's fucked for life for life. Wow. You know what I mean? Because like he was there in space in, a, in, a, in an environment that is not conducive to human biology. Right. But then all of a sudden, like his vision is down. He had to work out yeah, and the astronauts. They have to work out two hours a day hard, like on their legs to keep their bones from like basically like dwindling. Right. Well, what, well, what happens if you don't have, you know, bo- you can't use your bones anyway. Well, then you don't have to do that. Well, what happens if like, okay, well, if you need, if your vision's going down, well, what if you're blind? And so now there's this entire crazy kind of interesting, um, you know, again, like humanity of, of people uh, like trying to make it different, you know? And like, I, I, not to say that like, this is just again, like one example, but then even just the engineering feat, I mean, the international space station, even though, you know, say there's only a handful of company or countries that are ever any represented at one time by the human form, but there's like a hundred and something companies that did some type of part that keeps the ISS up in space. And that is the greatest engineering feat that humanity has ever done. And it's like, so again, like, 
Like we have it there. It's just, we have to like recognize that. And too many times, like you've kind of alluded to hard facts I've alluded to geopolitical stuff. I've, you know, all this kind of stuff. But the main thing that the overview effect is for me is that, you know, connection, human connection, but then also the reality of how it's messy. You know, we're, we're fucking awesome. Like we're the shit, but at the same time, like, we're terrible. <laughs> you know what I mean? And it's like the only way to really like um, contextualize all that is to be honest with ourselves and then like you be reflexive. And so that's really the biggest thing for the overview effects for me um, is, you know, again, have a wild dreams. You, there's nothing wrong with ambitious and, and crazy dreams of, of possibility, but then also there has to be a groundment to that. Otherwise it does kind of get into this, you know, um, scientism it gets on to into not uh, blind uh will for ignorance blind naivety you know all that kind of stuff and and then like we talked about well when you have a vacuum of sorts uh uh you know uh opportunistic you know humans that may not have the the, the best uh kind of intentions always kind of co-op things so not to say that we can't do that but like there, it, there's always going to be a 5% of shitheads, you know, in there. And so yeah. it's like, do we want to be uh, not knowledgeable and honest about them? And then like, try to, you know, make systems and frameworks and whatever to kind of mitigate that, be honest about it, be truthful. Or do we just like kind of want to spin the wheel and say, you know, good luck. And we got it under control because we're human. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. I don't know about that either. Well, it's, it's, I, I love this conversation because it progresses for me in such a clear direction and i love the fact that you've introduced me to to warm data um yeah. actually the description of of my podcast says that it's a podcast of the warm philosophy genre which is yeah, just okay. which is just okay. something something i came up with because it was intuitive for me but i've gotten nice feedback about it and i'm like yeah because philosophy has been for centuries this just these like floating ideas that have no bearing on on real human life and I love how uh, how this um, connects because I I, I agree a hundred percent with what you're saying about the the warm data there the the human connection and I feel like this whole part we've been talking about um, the benefits of the overview effect and yet the thing that it misses the thing that would complement it and I'm not sure we even gave it a name and I think I'm just about ready to call it the people view effect because this <laughs> is because this is being here it's great that you have the overview effect you see the larger inspiring picture that um that kind of nudges you on and and tells you to go for it and that, I mean the fact that we even got up there to see it I mean that alone it should say something right, you know what right, I mean? yeah yeah right <laughs> but 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 do not uh, do not lose your grounding in earth with those, um, you know, sacks of flesh that are human beings. That, <laughs> those meat that, vehicles. <laughs> yeah, the meat vehicles, you know, and, and connect with them. Make those invisible things between us and not just uh, not just ideas that are totally contained within ourselves. But and, and and not just these ideas that are transmitted between minds, but. Um, but eventually are not there, you know, just the idea of how an engine works. If I communicated it to you, it's, right. um, it's going to make your life better in the sense that you're going to build an engine for yourself. But that's mm -hmm. a very different set of ideas from ideas that I can communicate to you about how I appreciate you. And maybe we could start a village together. Maybe we could help one another out. Maybe, you know, I give you some life advice, whatever, things that have an impact that establish a strong connection like between you and me and not just with some other outside thing. So I think I'm about well, you should get Nora Bates and get Nora Bateson on here. She, she'll talk about it the whole time. You yeah, know? Let's, yeah, let's <laughs> let's get her. I, I'll work on it for sure. Um, yeah. So I, I'm, I'm really what, what do you think about the people view effect? I, I like it. I mean, maybe there's some, uh, you know, what we should do is uh, in, in Austria, if we meet up, then we're going to, that's going to be a workshop. 
we're going to, we're going to get a whiteboard yeah. or like a thing and just kind of, is it the humanity view effect? Is it, um, you know, any, any, uh, any of the other words that could be in there, people, et cetera, populate, you know, wh- whatever, like we can workshop it a little bit, but, uh, but that's a good first draft. I'm not going to lie. It's a good yeah. first draft, but maybe it's not a great <laughs> final draft, you know? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it has to grow on you. Um, but yeah, this is, this is what it's, it's all about, I think. And, um, uh, yeah, thank you, thank you so much for um, for finding the the time to finally do this. We both know that it wasn't easy to find the the time and energy, but we did. And hey, I'm two two did. months in the making, yeah, two months yes. in the making has been, or maybe now even three uh, since we first first talked. But yeah, thank you so much for inviting me, and then um, definitely very happy to be on again in in the future. But uh, you know, looking forward to 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 many other ideas and the deep dive, and and if anyone's kind of listening to this. And once other episodes, I would recommend, you know, the one with Nico, uh, Nicolas, and then also uh, with Visa, uh, two of those. So, you know, there, there's a lot, there's a lot going on in the deep dive and then definitely check us out, uh, you know, at Eclectic Spacewalk. Um, and then yeah, see exactly. if you find anything last, there. I, I was going to say last but not least, please uh, tell listeners where uh, you and your thoughts can be found. Yeah. I mean, eclecticspacewalk.com is easy, but if you just Google it, I mean, we have a sub stack, we have a podcast on anchor, so you can find it on all the, um, you know, platforms like Spotify, Castbox, all that stuff. And then also we have a YouTube channel so you can see, see video, uh, you know, and things like that. Um, or Twitter on, uh, e spacewalk or at e spacewalk. So yeah, there's a lot of different ways. Um, but looking forward to continuing the conversation with, you know, the deep dive, uh, you know, listeners and viewership. Um, but yeah, like it's, it's been great. And, you know, thanks so much for the invite and having me on. Yeah. Thank you so much, Nicholas. Till next time. Yeah. As they say in Germany, cheers. <laughs>